So good morning again. Uh, this is the uh, second panel of uh, our second day. Uh, and uh, this panel has to do with uh, banking and, uh, and finance, SWIFT finance. We are uh, blessed to have with us uh, major uh, industry participants actually from literally all over the globe. Uh, from Norway, from China, from the UK, um, and the US. Uh, so thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, this is a truly uh, very interesting panel, as all the panels of the day. I will turn it over to Bill uh, William Haft, uh, partner from Oric, who is going to be the moderator. And I thank you all for being with us. Thanks, Nick. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning to everyone uh, in the US. Good afternoon to those of you in Europe. And uh, good evening to those of you in Asia uh, who uh, we are pleased they're joining us uh, today. I'm Bill Haft. I'm a partner at Oric Harrington here in New York, head of our banking and finance group. And uh, I'm very lucky to have such a great panel of folks uh, to talk about where things are uh, in the um, finance markets for the shipping sector. Um, I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, I'm not going to uh, read everybody's bios. Uh, the background information for these uh, illustrious uh, gentlemen uh, is available through the, uh, the Capital Link site. But uh, we'll start off. We have uh, Lu Zhendong, uh, who is Deputy Head of Shipping, Bank of Communications Financial Leasing, China. Uh, Shreyas uh, Chabokati, who is Global Head of Shipping at Citibank. Evan Cohen. Uh, who is Managing Director and Group Head of Maritime Finance at CIT here in New York. Uh, Jack Zhu is also, uh, he's Deputy Head of Shipping at CMB Leasing, Financial Leasing, uh, also in, in China. Um, Christos um, Sakonas, who is the Global Head of Shipping at DNB. Uh, he, he joins us from, uh, from Athens. And uh, Stephen Fuster, who is Global Lead Shipping Finance at ING, and he's joining us from uh, outside London. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we'll just dive right in. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious to everyone. There are a number of issues that have uh, confronted uh, lenders and uh, financing sources for the last year or so, uh, certainly uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, there are lots of different things that have gone into uh, decision making and adjusting uh, for uh, all of your institutions. And I think it would be useful for the, uh, the audience and uh, for shipping companies and other participants in the markets to have a sense of where you are in terms of your credit considerations. Uh, we all know that COVID is the, uh, you know, the big topic that has affected a lot of economic activity in different places. And so that's certainly something I'd like for you to, to address. Uh, ESG has gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, interest um, uh, in uh, lots of quarters and certainly has affected credit. It's certainly a PR headline issue as well, but certainly from a credit standpoint, uh, it's been there for a while and now it's just gotten a lot more prominence. There are certainly geopolitical considerations. We all know um, that there's a, uh, you know, it, there's a big elephant in the room, uh, pun uh, very much intended uh, in terms of uh, elections happening, certainly in the United States, as well as uh, trade policy and sanctions policy and how that might be affecting things. Uh, and then there are other things that are just very classic credit considerations about the characteristics of the borrowers, the size, the vintage and number of vessels, whether they're public or private, that kind of thing. So uh, I figured we'd kick off by just asking each of you to talk a little bit about what you're uh, thinking in terms of your, your credit considerations and, um, and how all these, these different issues are affecting, affecting your thinking. Uh, I'm going to kind of go around the horn on what I see on my screen. So, um, uh, Christos, why don't you kick off and uh, you can maybe give us your take. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I think you've uh, introduced it very well. It's, uh, it's a difficult job being a banker in normal times. It's uh, even more challenging now. Um, you mentioned the pandemic. Uh, this indeed has had an impact. It has hit some industries more than others. 
uh, if you look at the cruise segment, for example, uh, revenues have gone down to zero, vessels are laid up, uh, car carriers have been hit quite a bit. Um, but, you know, tankers uh, at the beginning uh, had a very good, uh, you know, very good market. Now, of course, more challenging, dry, uh, also recovering. Containers have been uh, performed surprisingly well. Um, so I, I think, you know, being in shipping, we've been very used to external shocks. We've been very used to cyclicality. And, you know, if you contrast shipping with the airline industry, I think, you know, we have handled the, uh, the pandemic, you know, very well. Um, it's definitely a consideration. It was a very big consideration at the beginning of the crisis. What would the funding cost of banks be? What would be the availability of capital because of the pandemic? How would things pan out? But I think with the big injections of capital in the economy, things have stabilized uh, tremendously. And I would say, in terms of availability of capital, we are very much, uh, I would say, back to normal. Now, with the second wave, we have to see, of the pandemic, we have to see how this, this develops. But um, I think, you know, as far as the pandemic itself is concerned, uh, at the moment, it does not have a huge impact on our ability to do business. There are other factors, which I'm sure we will talk about later on, on environmental considerations, energy transitions. I think that these are topics that uh, have a very big impact and a very big effect on uh, our portfolio. But um, I don't want to uh, hijack the whole panel and talk about you know, everything all, all at once. So I, I will stop at that unless you want to ask anything, anything more. Sure, understood. Um, Shreyas. Sure, sure. Thank, thanks, Bill. And I, I think, look, Christos has already covered off uh, the way the banking committee looks at it. I just want to make sort of two points. In, in, in March, uh, when, when the whole thing started kicking off in a, in a material way, uh, a lot of attention arose within banks generally that, you know, this was going to be a, a huge systemic problem. Uh, but by April, May, it became clear that uh, there was a, a, a separation of the COVID impact between individual activity versus industrial activity, as I like to call it. So uh, shipping being an industrial activity was actually protected because you still needed to move goods, fertilizer, chemicals, you know, half finished goods, finished goods. Uh, whereas the individual was obviously impacted because the individual high touch services were, uh, you know, you couldn't go to cinemas, you couldn't go to restaurants, all that stuff. So I think that 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 sort of separation became very clear and we capitalized quite quite early on on that in the sense that we told our risk committees, you know, what we were seeing, we, we had evidence from clients uh, around volumes and things like that. So it was, we were able to manage it. So that, that's, that's the first point. And the second one is that, you know, obviously COVID, uh, the impact um, is, another, there is another impact here, which is that it has accelerated a number of the ESG and mainly the E part and to some extent the S part, right? Um, impact on, on, on our own portfolios, because suddenly all of these issues have come to the fore. You know, hydrogen has suddenly become such a massive topic, literally in over a, a last, last six, six weeks. Uh, before that, it was, it, was a, it was a theory, and now suddenly it's become extremely practical. So all of these uh, pressures on ESG are emerging, I think, as a result of COVID, people taking a long, hard look at their portfolios and saying, you know, where should I really be? Where should I be investing? Where should I be lending? And, um, and I think that's, that's a good thing for the planet overall. I know it's a tragic event with the, all the stuff that's happened, but uh, it has, in a way, you know, uh, pushed us onto a, a good track, I should, I should say. That's a good silver lining uh, <laughs> observation. It's always helpful to have some glasses half full or looking down, trying to learn lessons from the difficulties that we've got. Um, uh, Shandong, you know, China obviously yes. uh, has uh, uh, was was the first to have to deal and address with this issue. Uh, has come out of it at least from you know what we've seen, um, you know, uh, much better and quicker uh, than a lot of other places around the world for lots of different reasons. Um, how do you see these kinds of things playing into your credit decisions? Uh, good evening and good morning, gentlemen. Uh, uh, thank you, William. And uh, uh, as, according to uh, our uh, uh, observations and uh, so far, and uh, our portfolio and also the performance of our client, and uh, uh, it's working very well. And uh, we, 
we saw a uh, very high uh, repayment rate uh, in our portfolio still. Uh, thereby, and uh, we decided to to grow and uh, carefully. And uh, after uh, uh, and during the uh, pandemics, so so and uh, we did uh, uh, quite a big uh, test uh, pressure pressure test on our portfolio, and uh, we did uh, a good preparation and uh, for some uh, contingency plan or support plan if we are we are asked and if our uh, client raise their their worries. And finally, we found that everything uh, recover uh, to, to normal quickly, particularly uh, for the transportation market and uh, in containerization and the business and also in uh, tanker business. So, uh, uh, since, the, uh, uh, since March, and uh, we are uh, carefully resume our activities. So by the uh, end of the, uh, June, and uh, we have already delivered three over three billion dollar uh, into the shipping industry in new funding. So there is a, 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 a still a growth, although we are affected by the uh, pandemics. Uh, so the the growth is coming from the containerization, container ships, and also uh, gas carrier sectors. Uh, that's you our uh, criteria, so our attitudes, and to work. The was the sector we are able to develop so far. So, and I believe uh, uh, in the in the post COVID nineteen period, and uh, all our strengths uh, of the company still uh, exist. So we are still able to deliver uh, all our. Uh, our attention to the uh, to the demands and uh, coming from the market, so we are still able to uh, provide uh, quite a lot of our uh, money into the sector. Uh, we are uh, if it is in line with our strategy. So, so I think uh, 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 of course there are uh, some uh, threats to to our uh, model and. Uh, and finally, and I think uh, we still should pay a lot of uh, attention to to the second wave, but also uh, some uh, risk of uh, uh, geo geopolitical, and uh, particularly uh, for the long term stress uh, stress and uh, coming from the deglobalization. So that that is uh, uh, so far I want to uh, share with uh, uh, the colleagues. William. Thanks, uh, Shandong. That's interesting uh, that your activity level, although you're keeping your eye on the pandemic, that was still quite robust, it sounds, uh, during the you know, second and third quarters, keeping your eye on the uh, potential effects of a second wave and being careful in your managing risk. So uh, that's, a, uh, I think, somewhat consistent uh, theme that we're hearing. Um, Evan, how about you? You want to uh, dive in? Sure. I liked one expression from uh, Shandong, which was the, the real-time pressure test. So we've gone through a, a solid year of real-time pressure test. And at CIT, we've done quite well. So um, it, I think it comes from focusing on our core business, which are mainstream assets, low break even a conservative senior lender, and that gives us uh, some cushion. So we haven't had deferrals or uh, delays on repayment. And we've watched the container owners, as uh, Christo alluded to, performing quite well. Uh, the tankers enjoyed a, a nice bump for a while, and the dry bulk owners have always managed, uh, and the gas carriers as well. So focusing on the core assets, low break evens, Good owner operators and yeah, and voila, that's a decent leverage. And we've been weathering the storm. So pleased with that. We're going to continue to do that. Yeah, and then there's always the question you get from credit committee well, how about if there's a second wave and a third wave and if it goes on forever? Okay, well, <laughs> Some of these eight questions we cannot answer fully, but uh, we see our the ship owners coping with them quite well so far. So far. 
Thanks, Evan. Uh, Jack, how about you? Do you uh, echo uh, what uh, Zhen Dong had said uh, from your perspective in China? Yes, thanks, Bill. Uh, yes, but compared to uh, bottom leasing, uh, uh, for us, we uh, we uh, did uh, very uh, cautious at the beginning of the outbreak of the epidemic. We have uh, slowed down our little uh, deals in pipeline, so we have also run a lot of uh, press tests. So uh, and uh, yes, after uh, three months, so the the, the market just as the uh, just, just as uh, Chris uh, mentioned, so the the market still very uh, solid and especially for the container sector, so kind of with uh, all of the virus. So that's the good news for our for us and also uh, convinced our uh, uh, credit. So. The shipping industry still uh, is uh, is really resilient after the virus. And uh, what I'm wanting to say uh, for the post-COVID markets, kind of now in China, we kind of almost 90 uh, percent uh, return to the normal. So my view may be in the next one or two years, the impact from the uh, COVID-19 might be still there. Uh, maybe from the uh, shipping operating and the port uh, uh, facilities and the crew changes or some specific se segments like passenger uh, carriers, car carriers, just uh, Chris also mentioned that, still uh, have, uh, have some uh, problem to, uh, to, uh, to uh, go uh, to get through. So we encourage our clients to be prepared to consider more finance uh, sources and seek for longer tenant refinance for the existing uh, uh, finance portfolio. So, and also, uh, like Jin Deng mentioned, compared to the epidemic, also the, the, the trade war, the, the geopolitical issues, and also uh, US uh, elections maybe have some uh, external issues that could have long uh, term economic uh, growth. So, also, China now just looking to reduce the reliance to oversee maps and technologies. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we can read from the newspaper that China now just proposed a so-called dual uh, circulation model of growth uh, to steering the economy. E economy. This means uh, we will um, uh, uh, prioritize internal circulation to boost domestic demands and be uh, supplemented by external circulation. So, uh, and also we have tried to rebalance the economy towards to uh, consumption lead growth from exports and investments. So now we will import more goods from overseas. And, uh, and you can see according to the data, customer data. So uh, the third quarter of this year, China imports even hit record high so this is good news for our industry, for shipping, for ship owners. So I think that the demand from the Chinese market is still there, still very solid. So for the dry bulk segments, tankers, uh, containers, so we, we still are, are very optimistic. So we can uh, also together with the very few new building uh, orders placed. So we think now the asset is, 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 is good to look at. So this, this is my uh, wheel. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thanks, Jack. It, it's an interesting thing if you think about it, um, what you've just mentioned, uh, that uh, how things change. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, all eyes were on China and China demand and how it was affecting commodity flows from emerging markets and how that was trickling down to certain sectors of the, the shipping, uh, shipping industry. And, now, of course, uh, everything is focused on, on COVID, how that affects economic activity and trade, um, you know, along with uh, some of the, the trade war, geopolitical issues, and, uh, and, and now there's the, the layover of focusing uh, credit on other factors, ESG, for example, uh, although, again, I, I would say that that's been there, you know, for a while, um, and it's just now getting more attention than it should. 
Um, Stephen, how about you? Uh, what are you What are you seeing in terms of your credit considerations? Yeah, well, I, I'll try to be fairly brief because I suspect I'm only going to to echo the comments of the other panelists. So I suspect we're all we're all reading from the same page. And as they say, uh, great minds never differ. Oh, sorry, great minds think alike. I beg your pardon. And idiots never differ. So let's just hope it's the former and not the latter. But look, in ING, I don't think this has changed our approach to risk at all. Um, you know, we run the business very much as a relationship business, not as an outright asset finance business. And if you really want to run it as a relationship business, then you can't be in and out of the market. You know, your clients expect you to be there in the good times and the bad. And I think, you know, I hope that we've achieved that. And I think that's true for, you know, my fellow panellists as well. The other thing is that, you know, we know that shipping is volatile. And in actual fact, you know, what we've seen is much worse times than we're currently going through, perhaps with the exception of cruise, but we don't do cruise in ING. We don't understand it. For us, it's floating hotels and floating casinos. So we, we, we don't do cruise and we tend to stick to the sort of main sectors. And, you know, by and large, uh, I think that we have been surprised, um, particularly at the resilience of the container segment that's shown. You know, I think for the first time, we've really seen the liners managing capacity, and you can see that that's really paying dividends. You know, the major liners will make more this year combined than they made last year. Tanker owners should have a good year overall, um, you know, off the back of the very high rates at the beginning. I think it was entirely predictable that the market would come off. And, you know, we've seen dry bulk market increasing really off the back of imports into China, which I think, as we've heard, is, is probably returning more to normal, much more than we are in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I think, you know, we'll come on to this, I know, but I think the biggest issue for us in, in the sort of, the, if you like, the risk process is, is the E uh, in ESG. And I think that's also probably at the forefront of our owners' minds, too, when we talk to them. So no change in the risk appetite. Business has held up well. The portfolio has held up well. Uh, and actually, I'm still pretty optimistic going forward. Shipping is not going to go away. That's the thing we need to remember. You know, over 90% of world trade is seaborne, and we still account for less than 3% of global emissions. So, you know, we have a fantastic industry. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, it, it, it does sound yeah. like you're all consistent in, in how you've been uh, approaching these issues. I'm sure the relationships clearly are going to be a key part of, uh, you know, what all of you do. Um, uh, you're all in businesses that uh, have had, you know, uh, a long and, and uh, consistent uh, uh, role with uh, lots of different borrowers uh, over you know long periods of time. So uh, that's that's clearly you know part of your credit thinking. And so that kind of shifts over to the ESG, which you know has gotten a lot of coverage recently. There are the Poseidon principles. There's um, there there are all sorts of reasons you know uh, now with uh, climate change and a lot of uh, events, uh, weather events happening all over the world. Certainly here in the U.S., uh, everybody's keenly aware of, of some of those developments. So, um, and a lot of institutions uh, have been uh, making efforts, both from a credit standpoint and a, and a headline uh, standpoint, trying to, to, to manage that. How do each of you see that playing into the overall? And we did touch on a couple of topics. I think Shreyas mentioned hydrogen is something and um, uh, you know that the E is certainly a big piece of this. The G may have always been there for all of you uh, or most of you um has gotten some and the s sort of you know that that kind of cuts across different things so um why don't we go we'll go back around the horn uh steven how about yourself yeah look on the on the e um i don't think as an industry we yet have the answer um you know there's a lot of talk about lng but i think actually what has happened in the last I know six or nine months is that more questions have been asked about lng as a long-term solution uh, and we talk a lot about the methane slip, of course, and that's that's the downside of, of LNG, and it is still a fossil fuel. Um, but if you move away from you know, traditional fuel and, and gas, you know, we know what the options are potentially. You know, it's hydrogen, it's ammonia, uh, electric cells, etc. cetera. Um, and much of that technology is in place only on smaller ships traveling small distances. 
Now, how are we going to get a VLOC from Brazil to China on one of these new fuels? And I don't think you know, any of us really know yet. Um, but of course, you know, we have the IMO targets 2030, 2050. And, you know, 2030 is only just around the corner. And 2050 is probably only at the bottom of the street. You know, we're talking about assets with a 25 year lifespan. But I think, and I don't profess to have the, the answer, but you know, what, what has come of this is that banks have been much more transparent in what they're financing. The Poseidon Principles is clearly you know, leading the field in that respect. Uh, and you know, hats off to, to the, the banks who really set out to, to get that established. Um, I think from the owner's perspective, they're holding back on their orders a little bit for you know, the fact they don't know what the propulsion system is going to be going forward. And that has to be good for the industry as well, because we're limiting the supply side. When it comes to tankers, you know, we, of course, we're, we're monitoring our, our exposure. I don't have any overall limits, uh, either for shipping or specific asset classes. But I can tell you, we are obviously paying a lot more attention to our tanker exposure in particular, um, to make sure that, you know, the capital we have at risk is, is no more than we would ordinarily want to have. Um, so I think we're in this kind of hiatus right now where we're all aware of what the issue is, but we don't let yet know what the end game is. But I do think there's been a bit of a shift away in opinion from LNG as being the solution. That's my, my take. Jack? Jack. Yes, Bill. Yes, Bill. Yes, we, um, Definitely, we are support the Poseidon principle uh, concepts and all of these um, ESG uh, regulations and follow the, the, the Western banks like City um, uh, promote these kind of uh, principles. And recently, we are also very happy to see the big car owners have committed to a framework to cut the carbon emission. So this is mean the cost for the decarbon could be affordable and be absorbed by, by the, 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 the most rich uh, men in, in, uh, in the industry chain. So uh, if the cut owners uh, on the top of the value chain can uh, pay uh, to, the, uh, to the cost of this kind of decarbon, I think this is a very uh, good trend for all of these us and for shape owners and for financials. Of course, we are act as a lessor and, uh, and also a financial. Definitely, we wanted to, uh, to promote this uh, kind of new design, new field design shapes uh, for new buildings. Actually, we have uh, some cooperations with Citibank and also DMB Bank. We, when we do the refinance for some projects, so we incorporate the terms related to Poseidon principles to our uh, refinance framework uh, uh, new contracts with, with these Western uh, banks. That's mean, uh, that's mean in practice, we are, are performing these kind of uh, principles. And in the future, I think all of the Chinese resource also yeah, in discussion, if we can join or follow this kind of Poseidon principles, and maybe also we can uh, make our own principles to uh, echo this kind of uh, um, uh, international shipping uh, green uh, plans. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, so it sounds like you're, you know, you know I think both from a structural standpoint um, uh, and also your interaction with some of the banks and, and how you, you, you handle your financing, you're piggybacking a little bit on the principles, but it's also a credit decision that's a decision that you feel is in your interest. So um, I think that's, that's, a, that's an, interesting, uh, an interesting take. Uh, Evan, your take on, uh, on yeah. the ESG. Uh, yeah, uh, with every, like everybody else, is part of our consideration, important part. So a couple of tangible examples. On the we are very open uh, to financing middle-aged tonnage. So the age and the quality of the vessel always important, but open to that middle age where we can help extend the life before there's the demand on, uh, demand on all of the natural resources for newer tonnage. But very much focused on those vessels and owners that have been investing in the fuel efficient technology. So we've been supporting that with Scrubber Financing and other, and other projects. 
So like, you, like to support the fuel efficient middle-aged vessels, let's say. And then for us, the, the governance part, the G part, very important uh, to have the transparency, the information flow and the proper corporate behavior. Um, for us, it works very well with some of the PE platforms. So that's a large part of our business uh, and value clients. So we're supporting them. We find that very helpful in our governance process. And on the related to that, the sanctions process and where vessels are trading, we're very conscious of where our finance vessels are trading, and that's on a daily basis, and have very good response from our owners when anything comes up for question, whether it's coasted past Cuba or for whatever reason, it does call on a, a hot spot that it has the proper paperwork in place. And we're turning that around very quickly and you know, for all of us who've been in shipping for a long time, it's not that long ago that you wouldn't get much of an answer from an owner. And now we're insisting on it, but it comes without a headache. And if it comes with a headache, well, that's typically not our type of client. So we're getting good response from the owners on proper behavior. So a nice thing, nice, another nice development to see. So EST can be analogized to aspirin is what you're saying. One more time. ESG is analogous to aspirin. Yeah. Pain reliever. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Shandong, I assume uh, you echo uh, many of the uh, things that have been said so far. Yes, and with regarding to the E, it's quite uh, complicated uh, issues. But uh, Bokang and uh, it's doing uh, doing all a job uh, uh, with regarding to the E. And so far, we have already integrated uh, uh, green shipping or green tonnage uh, definition into our uh, uh, decision making process and also into our standard in order to uh, support uh, uh, the principle of the procedure. And uh, uh, early this year, and uh, we support and uh, we develop a, a fleet. Uh, uh, of our tankers with a dual fuel uh, engine powered. So it is a, a, a real practice and then try to make a trial to contribute our part uh, to the uh, international shipping and uh, uh, into our industry. So we are doing our part and uh, uh, basically uh, we, we, we are going to try and uh, uh, as, as far as we, uh, we, we, we can. Uh, uh, that is uh, what we are doing now. May, may I ask, because I, I found what you said quite interesting, how, how are you defining you know, green, green shipping? What, what are the criteria that you use to test you know, wh whether something is considered as green or not for your purposes? And uh, uh, according to our uh, understanding, and uh, if uh, the, the tonnage and is, uh, can burn less uh, fuel, or there is uh, less NOx or SOx and, uh, and, uh, in their operation, then and uh, we can simply uh, to define it is going for uh, green shipping. So uh, for the uh, green tonnage and. Uh, uh, it is also a, a quite a complex uh, uh, issue because then the, we are conducted with uh, uh, many experts and from the classification societies and uh, they, they said that uh, it, it might be a, a short-term solution uh, to, to, to taking the dual fuel engine to power the ships. And uh, uh, of course, there is a long-term and the consideration as well. So uh, we are uh, carefully and uh, conduct uh, with uh, the experts and in, in, in the industry and try to and, uh, uh, make some definition and of a green shipping or green tonnage into our uh, process. So, uh, so it's not easy jobs, and uh, but we are doing now. Would you? Um... Uh, I was thinking something different, you know, having all these yards in China, I was thinking that, uh, you know, when you said green shipping, that maybe there are some pilot projects where some yards are testing ammonia or hydrogen, and then you would be looking to finance this, this type of projects. But the way I understand it, it's, you know, same technology, as long as it's more efficient than what we have today, this is a step in the right direction. So it's 
classified as, uh, as, as green. Right? And uh, uh, we are carefully working with our client and uh, uh, we are financial and we are leasing company. And uh, so we, we, we have to conduct uh, uh, with uh, um, participants and uh, of the project to be sure that uh, uh, the, the socks or knocks or any, uh, any damaged elements can be reduced. So, so it cannot be done uh, by one uh, project. Maybe it takes time to achieve, uh, but we are doing this. Yes, can I, can I just uh, respond to Chris uh, for some words? So yes, it's very difficult to define uh, what's the green tonnage, what's the criteria of credit. Uh, before we use the EEDI index, but that is not enough, like Zhen Deng said. So maybe we also use uh, the, the, the engine uh, uh, SOX LOX uh, emission, but we lead, uh, we, we lead, we have exports in our credit panel. So that's very difficult for, for a bank, for a financial leasing company. But what we're trying to do is to cooperate with the uh, glass and the shipyards. And the recently I heard from the market, one or maybe some of the biggest miners may be planning to place new building orders for dual fuel uh, dry bugs or tankers in Chinese shipping yards. And they will provide a long-term uh, charter, a time charter or bubble charter uh, for this kind of new building orders. I think this is a good thing for us. If the big cargo owners or traders or oil majors can, uh, can just leave this kind of green tonnage new building orders, so financials can follow, can uh, be uh, very uh, uh, comfortable to provide finance because the ship value compared to the normal engine uh, ships, the value is high, more expensive. That means the OPEX and the CAPEX should be much more compared to the normal tonnage. So that means for our credit, maybe shall be very cautious if the cash flow can meet up our requirements. So if the big Kind of owners can play this kind of looping orders, can lead these kind of projects. That is easy for everybody. So, but that's also uh, maybe some traditional ship owners maybe uh, uh, not so welcome these kind of deals. So maybe I wanted to uh, let you discuss this. Uh, thank you. Christos, why don't you go ahead and then we'll let the Shreyas get the last word in on the, uh, on the issue that's near and dear to City's heart. Yeah, I know for me, you know, I like the way that Stephen put it. Uh, th there is a lot of uh, uncertainty right now when it comes to what's the next technology. Shipping thrives when there is uncertainty. The order book is being kept in check. So there is, uh, you know, a big uh, positive to all this uncertainty. And I think we will have good mar markets when it comes to, to shipping. The other thing that's extremely positive is that we see the whole shipping community extremely engaged on environmental matters for the first time uh, ever, I would say. Okay, Poseidon principles is one thing driven by IMO 2050. We have the charters now uh, setting up something very similar. Uh, there is no solution on the table at the moment and there are a lot of issues to consider. This is why I was asking Zendong before, you know, who is, you come up with a, with, with a project, you come up with a, with a new building vessel running on ammonia or any, anything else. Who is going to finance it? Because we are we are very good at understand. We hope we are very good at understanding credit risk. But now we have to assess technology risk. We have to assess performance risk. You know what's going to be the surviving uh, you know uh, engine type at the end of the day. So who is funding this? Is you know what the role are the charters going to play? What role are the yards going to play? Uh, export credit agencies maybe uh, other organizations. You know by virtue of the international nature of shipping, I don't think you can count on any single country providing subsidies. So that's a problem. So it's a very complicated puzzle we are looking to solve, but very positively, everybody seems to be engaged and everybody seems to want to get to a good, to a good solution. So uh, I, I like that. And it's, it's, it's gaining momentum very, very fast. If you see where we are today compared to six months ago, Compared to a year ago, it's you know huge, huge steps. So, so I'm very optimistic, despite all the uncertainty. 
Yeah, thank you. The credit, cre credit assessment is a lot more complicated than it used to be. Uh, Shreyas, please. I'm optimistic as well. I think you know, we're we, we discovering that gigantic forces are acting on our industry and finally people are actually pulling together to, to address it. Um, I, I, I think my concern is we, as Christos has already alluded to, I don't think we are uh, quite there yet in terms of some of the uh, detail around how new types of assets will get financed. I was thinking of wind turbine installation vessels, for example, a new, newish area of maritime um, assets where you know if, if there are only a couple of dozen of these operating, we need a hundred more. Who's going to finance that? How do we get comfortable with with construction risk? How do we get comfortable with counterparty risk and all of that? And that then goes to what Jack has said, which is, you know, the people at the top of the value chain, the, at the top of the food chain, they should be the ones taking the risk, whether it is upgrading current asset technology or whether it's new assets, because you expect that our counterparty, high quality, double A, single A rated counterparty to have the ability to do much better in financing those assets. So that's exactly the point. I mean, who you can't have a conversation about ESG without capital being part of that ESG uh, series of letters. And there's another thing that's missing here, which is digitization, which is absolutely critical for ESG because you can't improve. Operational efficiency is one of the biggest drivers of improvement around, especially the E part. And of course, to some extent, you know, the G part as well, because, you know, uh, Evan was talking about a sale by of Cuba. How do you know that unless you're actually measuring where the ship is and what is it doing, right? So, so you have to measure, you have to get data. And we are just at the beginning of a very long arc of development around this. And yesterday we heard Graham Henderson uh, speaking on his thing. He's saying, what is it? They, they collect what, uh, 300 uh, megabytes per minute or something of ship data, per, you know, they started measuring it. Um, I think these are the critical elements of it. I think we, we are still at the very, very beginning. We are beginning to understand that forces are acting on us and we are reacting and that's great. Thanks. So we're, we're running short on time. Uh, thanks, Reyes. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. I'll take one question uh, that we've gotten and maybe in very, very quick answers from each of you. The question is, are, uh, are there particular sectors that you're focused on currently uh, or are you sector agnostic and are there sectors that you see down the road that might, might uh, be more attractive? Uh, Shreyas. I, I alluded to wind turbine vessels. I'm, I'm very interested to see how that pans out uh, because I, I think it's part critical part of the maritime infrastructure. I'm interested in seeing whether floating power plants uh, take take shape, uh, floating warehouses. The, 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 the more we can use the maritime infrastructure uh, for new thinking, new ways of using the oceans in a responsible way, the better for all of us in maritime finance. And I think we probably need to find new ways of using capital other than you know the traditional hydrocarbon heavy ways we've been doing it in the past. It's going to get done to us. So we should do it before we get done, it gets done to us. Christos. I mean, we focus much more on relationships to be honest with you than on um, sectors. And when I, when I mean relationship is how are people handling this crisis? How are they coming out of this crisis? And this is how we get management teams validated. This is how we get to feel comfortable. So I cannot say we're going to pick one asset class over another, but I can tell you which management team we're going to back after we've seen them tested by all of these challenges that we, we, we have had thrown at us. Understood. Uh, Stephen. Well, very much the same as, as Christos and sort of harking back to what I said you know, earlier on, that for us, it's very much about a relationship and much less about the asset. But just very quickly, I think with the new technology coming in, what we're going to have to get better at as an industry is carving up those risks and allocating it to the, to the, the part of the industry which is best placed to take them. So you know, the shipyard should take the technology risk, the owner should take the operating risk, the banks should take the credit risk, and guess what? The charter is going to have to pay more for it. But, you know, frankly, if we doubled the cost of shipping, we as consumers would not notice the difference. It costs 50, less than 50 cents to move an iPhone from China to West Coast America. If you double that, you're putting a dollar on a phone, which probably costs $800. You're not going to notice it. Shandong, I think you mentioned containers before as a sector where you're focused. Yes, and uh, I believe uh, we will stick to green tonnage. 
and actually uh, green tonnage is our focus. And I guess uh, the, the second uh, 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 sector that we are uh, put, our, put our attention is the gas carrier sector. And uh, uh, of course, and, uh, uh, we, we think uh, uh, the future, in the future, there will be more uh, clean energy to be transported uh, uh, by sea. So uh, both container uh, ships and, uh, all, uh, and the gas carrier will be our uh, priority to, 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 to finance. So that is our uh, preference so far. Evan, and then Jack, give you the last word. Yeah. Uh, agree with everything, but we'd like to have our cake and eat it too. So they should all be responsible owners and fuel efficient and people we have good relationships with, but they should also be container ships, bulk carriers, tankers, or gas carriers. Got it. We'll yeah. find our good relationships there. <laughs> yes, I, I fully agree. Uh, yeah, with uh, Evan, uh, Chris, and uh, Stephen. So shipping always is a, a relationship business. So we 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 all cooperate with uh, each one uh, in this uh, uh, industry chain, and even cooperate with banks or other resources and contribute our own part. Uh, for, uh, yeah, for the industry, we committed here. We sit here to together with our clients to get through this uh, uh, challenging time. Thank you. Thank you, and thank everybody on the panel. This has been terrific, a great conversation. I uh, appreciate your time, and Nick, back over to you. Well, thank you. All I have to say is thank you very much. Tremendous panel. Thank you, guys. You covered really everything. Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you to each one of you. Thank very you. well. Thanks, Thanks very much, much Nicholas. Bye. Take care. Bye.